It is a true honor and a deep personal pleasure uh, for me to briefly introduce tonight uh, Rav Dr. Ari Berman to deliver the Hausman Stern Kinnis Chuva Lecture in honor of the memory of Elias J. and Mary Stern and Moshe and Chava Hausman. Ari Berman is not only president of YU and so fittingly president of YU as someone who combines not only deep academic achievement and tremendous midot uh, tovot representing everything we believe in both intellectually and ethically, personally, but as someone who combines not just the intellectual knowledge, but I think the true wisdom of everything out there in the world with its root in the wisdom of all areas of our Torah. Ari is an alumnus of this very uh, Beit Midrash, the first president of YU ever to have learned in the Ritz Israel Kolel, and uh, an old friend and former Chavruta. It is a, uh, really, with tremendous uh, pleasure and anticipation that I introduce to you Rav Ari Berman. Thank you so much, Rabbi Bednarsh. Uh, as Rabbi Bednarsh mentioned, we were uh, former chavrusas, and I have many stories I can share with you about Rabbi Bednarsh afterwards. All of them, of course, amazing and stunning in his breadth and depth of knowledge and kindness and compassion as a human being. It's really uh, my honor to speak at this historic uh, Tshuva Drasha, the Hausman Stern Tshuva Drasha, it's particularly fitting during this time period to have this drusha on Zoom, combining our Israel and New York drusha, both in person and also virtually throughout the world. I'm deeply grateful for all of the people who made this happen, uh, Rabbi Robert Shore, our amazing executive director, uh, Stephanie Strauss, and all of the people who uh, ensured that this event uh, can take place for not just our people here, but all the people uh, who are listening throughout the world. It's my honor to speak in the presence of the Hausman Stern families and their virtual presence, families with whom I have a personal relationship with back from my days when I was rabbi in Manhattan. And it's especially an honor to be back in this Beit Midrash, as Rabbi Bednarsh uh, pointed out, a Beit Midrash that I myself uh, was nourished and learned and grew uh, with such fond uh, memories and such an appreciation of everything that this place uh, stands for. Uh, this place could not be as special, as distinct, uh, as profoundly impactful, if not for the presence, wisdom, and guidance of Rebbe Umori, Arosh Kola, Rabbi David Miller. It's just as chus to be standing here in Rabbi Miller's presence. I've learned so much uh, from Rabbi Miller, uh, so much Torah and so much about life and how to live in one's life as a true Eved Hashem. Uh, it's really uh, great to be here with my dear friend, Rabbi Chaim Eisenstein, also a longtime friend, uh, uh, dating, back, uh, dating us back uh, two years ago, uh, to virtually be in the presence of our distinguished dean, and also a dear friend, Rabbi Menachem Penner, and all of the Rosh Yeshiva Rabbanim and leaders who are with us and joining with us uh, on this, uh, in this year. Uh, I have to say that it's clear from uh, the scheduling of this that clearly these schedules are not fans of the NFL and opening day at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time did not cause them to hesitate in any way and I appreciate that, and I thank everyone for joining us, for tuning in and joining us this afternoon and tonight. You'll find the link to the source sheet uh, that we'll be using online as well. 
You know, this has certainly been a year like no other. Uh, there have been challenges and difficulties, also opportunities and new ventures. But coming to Yom Kippur and thinking about the weight of this past year, one of the elements that stands out most in my mind is loss and avelut. Within a quick stroke of a year and a half, when all of this has started, so many people who were once here are now gone. So many great leaders, so many rabbis, so many people in our extended Yeshiva University community, so many neighbors, and even members of our family. For me personally, as we come to the Amim Noraim and Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, I'm thinking a lot about my father-in-law, who passed away at the beginning of the summer after a 15-month battle with cancer. We have lost so much and so many. And the question for us is not just how we move into the future, but how do we heal from our past? And this, I think, is a central theme of Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur is many things. It's about fasting, praying, it's about hoping, but perhaps most of all, it's about healing. Allow me to explain. One of the central images in the rabbinic literature about Yom Kippur is books, particularly the Book of Life and the Book of Death. If you look at your source sheet in source number one, the Gemara in Rosh Hashanah says, I'm a Rabbi Avo. Amru Malachi Ashari Slefne Kadosh Baruchu Rabonashal Olam. Mifne Ma in Yisrael Omrim Shir Lefanecha Brosh Shana Vyoma Kippurim. The the Malachim wonder, they ask Hashem, how is it that Am Yisrael does not say Shira in Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur? We say Shira, we say Halal, and all the other Yomim Tovim. Why don't we say Halal on Yom Kippur and Rosh Hashanah? Amr Lahem, Hashem answers them, Efshar, Melech Yoshev, Al Kisei Din, V'sifrei Chayim, V'sifrei Mesim, Batuchem Lefanav, V'yisrael Omrim Shira. Is it possible that a king will sit on throne in judgment when the book Sifrei Chaim, Sifrei Mesim are open in front of him and Yisrael and the Jewish people will sing Shira? It's just a famous Gemara, a famous image of what's open before God at this time is the Sifrei Chaim and Sifrei Mesim. So what exactly does that mean? What would you say? What does the Sifrei Chaim, Sifrei Mesim mean? an interactive shear. Even new old Lim can answer. So what uh, what does it mean, Sifrei Chaim, Sifrei Mesim? No? Book of Life, Book of Death. And what is the Book of Life, Book of Death referring to? Who's going to live, who's going to die in the coming year? So the simple way that we would naturally understand it is the Book of Life and Book of Death, it determines our fate. Right? It's the book in which we are written either in the book of life or the book of death, and our fate for the future is decided. And we understand that if you look at source number two from the well-known Gemara in Rosh Hashanah, that Amar Rebbe Krispudai, Amar Rebbe Yochanan, Shlosh Esfaram Niftachin Broshana, the three books that are open on Rosh Hashanah. Echad Shal Rosham Gemurim, Ve'echad Shal Sadikim Gemurim, Ve'echad Shal Benonim. One for the totally wicked, one for the totally righteous, and those are, who are in the middle. Tzadikim gemurim nechtavim v'nechtam la'alter l'chayim. The Sefer Chaim. Rosham gemurim nechtavim v'nechtam la'alter l'misa. The Tzadikim are immediately written in the Book of Life. The Rosham and towards death. Benonim tzluim v'ondim rosh Hashanah v'ad yom kippurim zachu nechtavim l'chayim lo zachu nechtavim l'misa. The people in the middle, 50-50, they have 10 days. If they merit in those 10 days, they're written in the Book of Life. If not, the Book of Death. And that's what we naturally think. What are the books that are open before God? It's the books that determine our future fate. What I want to share with you tonight are two alternative approaches to this question, 
one historical and the other psychological, which I believe add much to our understanding of Yom Kippur and what this day and what we are what this day is about and what we are supposed to do and think about during this day. So the first we'll deal with the historical. If you look at source number three, the Shulchan Aruch says, There's a minog to pledge charity on Yom Kippur for the dead and mention their neshamot. So when do we do that? What's that colloquial known for us? As Yizkar. What is Yizkar? Yizkar is you mention the name of the person who passed away and the tzedakah that you're going to give for their memory. There's a minig to do this on Yom Kippur, Yizkar. Why do we do this on Yom Kippur? Because those who passed away also receive atonement on Yom Kippur. Now, this is very interesting. When do we say Yisker during the year? When do we say Yisker during the year? How many times do we say Yisker during the year? So we say it four times. Three in the last day of, the, of each of the Shalosh Regalim, and one on Yom Kippur. But actually, the minhag of Yisker started in Yom Kippur. On Shalosh Regalim, there was another minhag in the uh, Yimei Ben Ayim, to give tzedakah, and, and those minhagim interwove and eventually became Yisker for all four. But actually, Yisker started just on Yom Kippur. And you could see the development in the Machzor Vitri is the first time we, we see it mentioned in the, uh, in the, the Rishonim, that the Machzor Vitri, student of Rashi, uposkim tzedakah bram, source number four, al chayim on And you, we, we give tzedakah, on Yom Kippur, for the Chaim and Meitim, the Ein Post and Sagat the Meitim Chal Eretz Ashkenaz Rakhayom. Only on Yom Kippur, only on Yom Kippur do we give Tzedakah for the Meitim. Okay? And you look, the Minog develops even further. If you turn the page to uh, source number three, you have uh, 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 the Minog Marseille. We see it extended in Provence. Similarly, in the 13th century, in the 12th century, I'm sorry, in the Sefer Rokeach, you see it again in Germany uh, towards the end of the uh, 12th century, the beginning of the 13th century, by the Orzerua, uh, Rav Yitzchak of Vienna, already the beginning of the 13th century. He says that this is a minag shebechol mikomot. All places do this minag. This spread rapidly. We first see it in the Machzor Vitri. spread quickly. All places are doing yisker. They're doing, giving staka. And Dafka on Yom Kippur, because it's kapara, not just for the Chaim, but also for the Meitim. Now, this leads to some obvious questions. Any questions come up about uh, kapara for the Meitim by you giving staka? Any thoughts about that? Is that obvious to you? Is that not obvious to you? What do you think? Does it make sense? Is that theologically sound? Why not? How do you get kapara when you're dead? You didn't do any tshuva. How do you get kapara when you're dead? A, you didn't do any tshuva. B, so if that other person gives staka, what does that got to do with you? So he does a mitzvah. What does that have to do with you? Now, this bothered... Uh, a number of Rishonim. It really bothered the Gaonim. I'm not going to have time to go through it with you now, but I put it down for you in the source sheet so you to look at uh, afterwards if you're interested. That Rav Shri Ragon and Rav Haigon were very bothered by this concept that somebody else can do a good deed and that it could merit the other, another person. It seems to go against the whole sense of schar and Onesh. There are deep theological questions. Uh, that emerge from this concept of Yisker. Like, how does, how are you rewarded? Like, what is it about, about your actions that you reward in Olam Haba? Can somebody else do mitzvot for you? 
Okay, there are other concepts in halacha that this emerges. What else? What else do you think about when you when this question is raised? Say again, kaddish. Great. How does kaddish work? Great. That's a great one. How is it somebody saying kaddish uh, 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 lifts the soul, gives the neshama and aliyah? Any other questions that come up? Learning mishnayos li'lo nishmas. Anything else interesting? Yeah. Yeah, so, and further, isn't our theology, they've already been judged in their lives. How could they change their, their station? Right, and even broader questions, things like Yisachar Zvulun. Like, what does that mean? And somebody else learns and this guy works. And Schar is, is transported. Like, what, is, what exactly does that mean? I actually had this situation once. Um, really, we have a wonderful Balabas, amazing Balabas. I love him dearly. And he said to me when I moved into, became the president of YU, he said, I want to buy this farm for your office. And sure enough, like a couple weeks later, like my office was packed with all new farm. He just bought for me, for the office. And when he was saying it to me, he said, but I want to get the schar for what's learned from that. So... Um, not that I was, I was worried about sharing schar, but theologically, I didn't know if that worked. So I didn't want him to think that it was conditional to that. So I said, you know what, let's leave the schar part for Hashem to decide. And then we'll leave that. But if you want to buy <laughs> this farm, totally happy to do that. Totally happy to do that. And he's really, he's a very special man. I love him dearly. And uh, he uh, filled the, uh, the shells of the farm. But it, it's all these theological problems. Or questions are raised by such uh, by the concept of yisker, which is a minog that, of course, is spread all throughout Am Yisrael. So, so there are a number of different answers. I just share with you one line of thought. If you look at source number ten, Sefer Hasidim, um, of Yudah Chassid, of the German uh, Pietists, uh, and addressing this uh, very question, says you can look by the underlines. Um, how can an action help someone who is not, uh, who didn't do it himself when he's alive? What does it mean when you say the son, the child is mezaka, is, uh, brings merit to his father? Let's say you have a father who sinned in his life. Or But the father gave to the son the possibility. The father paid for his education, his Jewish education. And the father gave to him the possibility of learning and teaching Torah and doing Masim Tovim. Since it was really through the father that the son was able to do all these good deeds. Every time the son does something good, it goes back and speaks well of the father. Now, this concept, which I think is something that you've heard, you know, in Kaddish and other, other explanations in this way, has really developed deeply by the Rav. If you look at source number 11, the Rav, uh, the, if, you, if you don't have it, I, I strongly suggest getting the Machzarim of the Rav on Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, and you have a lot of time to... Uh, uh, to read through those days, and uh, um, really some amazing uh, divrei Torah, and it's very important in general. Let me just say for everyone here and everyone listening, and all the talmidim of Yeshiva University, to immerse ourselves in the thought of the Rav. We are talmidim of Rav Salavechik. To immerse ourselves in the thought of the Rav, like everyone should. Uh, like look at the basics of, of what the Rav wrote and what the Rav stands for. All of our Rebbeim, all of our Rosh Yeshiva, you know, stem from that Mesorah. We have a Mesorah. Okay, very important to immerse yourself in the works of the Rav. So the Rav, in, uh, uh, in writing about this very issue, says the reason for continuing judgment of those who are no longer alive is source number 11, is that the consequences of a person's sin cannot always be immediately determined. For example, 
one may have raised the child with a proper religious education. As a result, the child will later turn his back on Judaism, which will in turn result in the assimilation of his own children and grandchildren. Similarly, if a parent did indeed provide his child with a good religious education, but with minor deviations, the consequences may not be evident for generations. Even though the parent has died, therefore he's rejudged every Rosh Hashanah for the accumulated consequences of the child's upbringing. The dead are judged on every Rosh Hashanah for actions whose consequences were not realized until that very year. So for the Rav, he understands that Sifrei Chaim and Sifrei Mesim is not the book of life and the book of death, but it's the book of the living and the book of the dead. That what is open before God on Yom Kippur is the book of the living and the book of the dead. And we affect not just our own judgment and our own fate, but we affect the stories and the judgment of the past generations as well. Now this is tied into the essence of what tshuva is about and how the Rav explains the whole concept of tshuva. Philosophers have long wondered, how does it make sense that if somebody sins, so he, should be, he or she should be punished? How does tshuva come to wipe that away? And wherever you're going to explain that, how to wipe away punishment, how do you explain the next level of tshuva, which we know is the Gemara differentiates between Tshuva Meir and Tshuva Me'ava, where the sins turn into Zchuyot. How could it be that something bad, a sin, can turn into a merit? How can that possibly be? So the Rav explains in Allah Man, if you look at source number 13, that the way that the whole concept of Tshuva works is that when you think of the past, when one thinks of the past naturally, they think that the past is dead. What happened, happened. You can't change the past. You can only change the future. And the Rav says is that by changing the future, you actually do change the past. The future imprints and stamp on the past and determines its image. We have here a true symbiotic synergistic relationship. The cause is interpreted by the effect moment A by moment B. The past by itself is indeterminate, a closed book. It is only the present and the future that can pry it open and determine its meaning. So if somebody does something, it naturally leads to consequences. But you determine what those consequences are. And by determining those consequences, you redefine what that act was. So if you look at the underlines, source number 13, the main principle of repentance is that the future dominate the past and there reign over it in unbounded fashion. Sin as a cause and as the beginning of a lengthy causal chain of destructive acts can be transformed underneath the guiding hand of the future into a source of merit and good deeds, into love and fear of God. The cause is located in the past, but the direction of the development is determined by the future. Great is repentance, for deliberate sins are counted as meritorious deeds. The sin gives birth to mitzvot, the transgression to good deeds. Meaning, as the Rav explains, if one sins, a veragorat avera, normally it has bad consequences. But if one uses that sin as a catalyst for good deeds, for tshuva, then that act is redefined. The future redefines the past. And it's not seen as a bad thing, but as a catalyst for good things and can turn into zchuyot. That is tshuva. The chiddush, what the Rav is saying about Sifrei Chaim, Sifrei Meitim, is that it doesn't just happen in your own lives. Is that you define the story of the generations and the lives before you as well. Let me explain with the story. I remember once, I grew up in Forest Hills, Queens. I don't know if you've been to Forest Hills. It's a wonderful place. And a couple of blocks away from me, uh, my grandparents lived. And I would walk over and see my grandparents. And every time I walked in, they were so happy to see me. I was the grandson. They gave me cake. They gave me cookies. 
Always happy. One day, I don't know, I might have been 10, I don't remember exactly, 11. I walked into my grandparents' house, and my grandmother was sitting in a chair, and she was despondent. And this really must have stuck in my mind, because it was so unusual for such a thing to happen. And I said to my grandmother, why are you upset? And she said something that blurted something out. She probably wasn't thinking, but again, it really stayed in my head. She said, when we left Europe, we went the wrong way. We should have gone east. And we went west. So my grandparents <coughs> lived in uh, Poland. And right before the war, my grandfather, our Arya's great-grandfather, went to, um, uh, left to start in Hartford, Connecticut, and build uh, life for them. And my grandmother left with uh, Arya's grandfather, uh, Julie Berman, Yudel, as they called him, and his older brother, Meyer, and my grandmother. They left on the last boat out of Europe. It was Mamish, the last boat out of Europe. It was a famous boat. The Baba Cherebi was there. It's a story in my family that like, my, my grandmother didn't want to leave because she thought that it wasn't clear if the stars were out. And, she, you know, it was in Shabbos, and they're like, the Baba Cherebi's ready on board. And I'm like, okay. So she went also and <coughs> saved her two sons. Afterwards, uh, she, they had more children, my father and my aunt Esther. And they lived their lives in, uh, uh, first in Connecticut, then they moved to New York. And when my grandmother was saying, my grandma was upset that she didn't make Aliyah, she didn't move to Israel. She was upset that she didn't move to Israel. And she was saying, you know, when, when we left Europe, you know, we went west to America, we should have gone east, we should have gone to Israel. So that story <laughs> stayed with me my whole life. And I've thought about it at different times of my life. One time I thought about it specifically was when my son was being mitgayes into the army. There's something so uh, transcendent. When you bring your, when I brought my oldest son, you bring your son into the big day Kodesh of Tzava, in the Jewish state, to serve in the Jewish army. And as I was bringing him with such, so many emotions, I thought that I'm not just bringing him, but my grandmother's with me too, that she's bringing him as well. And she can look at her life very differently now, because she was looking at going to America, in this case, as a step away from Israel. But actually, because her generations continue her story, it wasn't a step away from Israel. It was a step towards Israel. Because our actions define and redefine, not just our lives, but the past generations before. Take somebody who's called the Choser B'Tshuva. You have somebody who grew up <coughs> secular. And they spent their life secular. And then at some point, you know, over the course of their 20, 30 years, they stumble onto YU Torah. This actually totally has happened, by the way. We've had people who've come through YU Torah and they found <coughs> something special and they started a process and they become observant. And what do we call them? Choser B'Tshuva. In what sense were they choser? Did they return? They never were observant before. So they weren't observant before. But parents, grandparents, great-grandparents, wherever, however far you go, it's choser b'tshuva, Knesset Yisrael. We're one, it's past generations. What we do today defines not just our story, but also the past story. It's not just the book of life and book of death. It's the book of the living and the book of the dead are open before God on these days. And we write the story. We write the story. 
That's the second interpretation of Sifri Chaim, Sifri Neta. Historical. I wanted to share a third uh, uh, interpretation, which is psychological. Now, when I think of psych the psychology of tshuva, often for me, I go to the thought of Hans Lowalt, who was a famed psychoanalyst in the uh, 20th century. So he writes, if you look at source number 14, he writes, those who know ghosts tell us that they long to be released from their ghost life and led to rest as ancestors. As ancestors, they live forth in the present generation, while as ghosts, they are <coughs> compelled to haunt the present generation with their shadow life. There are ghosts and there are ancestors. If you can lay your ghosts to rest, talking about psychoanalytically, they can turn and become ancestors. So let me explain uh, with a case that was brought by uh, relational psychoanalyst Stephen Mitchell. And let me just say that uh, I'm indebted to my dear friend, Dr. Danny Rothenberg, who introduced me to these thinkers and this very line of thinking. We used to have these great uh, events at the Jewish Center when I was rabbi, uh, dealing with uh, uh, psychological aspects of tshuva. And he really helped, helped you know, bring this to me, to my attention, this line of thinking. So I'm deeply thankful uh, to you, Danny. So let me uh, share with you a story uh, from Stephen Mitchell. Look at source number 15. Consider Kate, a young woman in her mid-30s who entered psychoanalysis because of a history of frustrating, abortive relationships with men. She suffered from the not uncommon tendency to choose men who seemed strikingly unavailable for relationships. Okay, so Kate came to Stephen Mitchell. She had a problem with finding uh, uh, a relationship with, uh, with a man. And she came to him for analysis and help. So look at the second paragraph. Interspersed with our focus on her current experiences were accounts of Kate's complicated relationships with members of her family and her early life. She grew up quite poor in a working class area of a small industrial town. Her father was an alcoholic and reclusive, and her overburdened, depressed mother was generally unavailable to her and her several siblings. Both the mother's mother and brother lived with the family. At first, the uncle seemed to be an insignificant figure in Kate's development, but little by little I realized how important he was. Unlike the parents, he was somewhat worldly and successful. He owned a car, seemed skilled at enjoying life. He would take other family members out for drives on the weekends, knew about movies and other forms of entertainment, and was a much more exciting figure than Kate's father, who paid very little attention to her. The uncle was a great favorite of the mother and in many ways filled the vacuum created by the father's withdrawal. When Kate was several years old, the uncle was arrested for a serious crime. Kate remembered going with her mother to the trial and the enormous grief that enveloped the whole family. The uncle was sent to prison for five years. When he rejoined the family, he was a different man, angry, embittered, burnt out. He became tyrannical and frightening. He bullied the children, unopposed by the parents, and Anna, or Kate, sorry, grew to hate him. I slowly developed the hypothesis that this uncle had been very important to her, not just through fear in her later childhood, but through positive feelings in her early years. Kate did not like my suggestions along these lines. As far as she was concerned, she hated her uncle and did not even want to talk or think about him. So he writes about the story and how Kate rejected his interpretation of her problem, which was that her uncle was being, she was reliving the experiences of her uncle onto other men, and therefore she was having trouble forming relationships with men. She chose people who are like her uncle. She had trouble forming relationships because she was afraid. And that was his analysis of what happened to her. She rejected it. And they talked about the rejection, and they worked out between them, you know, that their relationship was still able to be strong. Kate and her therapist, Stephen Mitchell. Subsequently, 
she started being able to develop a relationship with a special man that she found in her life. So look what Stephen Mitchell said about it. I have no idea. You see that? I have no idea about the impact of that particular interaction. It is difficult to know. But I find it compelling to think about in terms of Lowell's way of thinking about the relationship between past and present. Kate's uncle was a ghost, a piece of the past filled with passionate intensity that was split off through repression from her present experiences. We might well say that her current relationships with men were haunted by her lost, dangerous feeling towards her uncle. I believe something of that relationship came alive in, in our interaction. My interpretation was much more complicated and spoken in a more authoritative voice than is my custom. I think there was a kind of teasing and what I took to be the twinkle in her eye and her ambition to prove me all wrong. I believe Kate and I were working out something about power, negotiation, and play. None of this was self-conscious at the time. The meanings were constructed retrospectively. But I think Kate was experimenting with whether I could yield power differently than her uncle did, whether she could back me down. I had become her uncle. But this time, we worked out a different outcome. What Stephen Mitchell's suggesting is that by transference, he became her uncle. He was the man in her life. And they had a tension. Normally the cycle in the tension would be that they would break off, they would split. But in this case, they were able, even though he was the uncle, they were able to resolve the tension in a way that Kate was able to feel good about herself. And that allowed her to then move on and develop relationships with other people. Mitchell's illustration reflects the way in which the present can alter our relationships with our past. In the present, we relive past relationships. If you have a healthy relationship with your past, so it will give character and vitality to your present, and also allow for change, development, and growth. An unhealthy relationship will leave you stuck, continuously repeating destructive patterns of behavior. But if one relives the past and is able to work out a new ending, then not only is one freed from a bad cycle, but one creates the opportunity to bury the past and lay it to rest as an ancestor. In this case, the reconciliation that Kate reached with Mitchell enabled her to reconcile with her past as well. Lowell's theory and Mitchell's illustration highlight the potentially powerful effects of a positive healing conversation, especially one that ends with reconciliation. And this is why I would suggest a one layer of why the halacha insists on mechila before Yom Kippur. You go over and you ask people for mechila, you heal relationships that have been broken and fractured. There are many layers be behind any interaction or altercation. It's difficult to know the internal place from where a sin against another comes. The request for mechila and the healing of that relationship, a warm relationship that returns, has the power to affect conscious and subconscious levels. In reliving her past with her uncle by transferring it onto Mitchell, Kate was able to work out a different ending to her destructive cycle and thus be able to bury the ghosts of her past. Our current actions can heal past wounds. Our past relationships can haunt us, but once they're led to rest, they can live on as ancestors. When you ask for mechila and cure this relationship, it can potentially be curing not just this relationship, but many relationships that were fractured beforehand and cycles of destructive pa uh, patterns of behavior. This is what tshuva is in its most profound sense. It's a famous Gemara, which is hard to understand. If you look at source number 16, 
The Gemara says, Hechidami Baal Tshuva. What's the case of a Baal Tshuva? Amar Rav Yehuda, Rav Yehuda says, Kigon Shabbata Liado Dvaravera Pamrishonu Ushnia Vinitzel Heimanu. You know what the case is? If you come to the same, if you come to the situation, do the Avera again, one time, two times, and you're saved from it, you're a Baal Tshuva. Michvi Rav Yehuda Bosu Isha Bosu Perik Bosu Makom. Rav Yehuda then demonstrated and said what he means is if it's with the same woman, the same time, or, or, or period of time, the same place. Okay. Now, the Rambam famously quotes this Gemara, but he adds something different to it. If you look at source number 17, what does the Rambam add to this? How does he interpret or, or change at least what we have written in the Vilna Shas? Look at 17. Now I'm speaking to the call. So you can. So what, uh, what's the difference between how the Rambam cites this Gemara and actually how the Gemara is at least uh, the girsa of the Gemara and the Shas that we have. So the Rambam talks about Tshuva Gemura. Okay, why does the Rambam switch to Tshuva Gemura? If we think about it, what are the odds that somebody's going to fall into the same situation at the same time in the same place? What are the odds? And that's the definition of a Baal Tshuva, then nobody's going to be a Baal Tshuva. What are the odds? So the Rambam talks about Tshuva Gemura. Now even then you have questions. That's Tshuva Gemura? Like if you don't do that, you're not going to have Tshuva Gemura? So that's one difference. Any other differences in the Rambam quotes it? The Rambam talks about one time, not two. Okay, any other differences? Yeah. It doesn't talk about, well, there actually he does, uh, let's see. He does, he, he do, when he brings the case, he does uh, mention the same time, same place. But it's true, it's not the same, uh, it's not as belate. Other, other differences? Yeah. So Tshuva is the reason why he does it, okay? In the Rambam, when the Rambam quotes his Gemara, he says that the reason why he doesn't sin is because of Tshuva. So there's a key word here that the Rambam says. It's different than the word that we see in the Gemara. What's the key word? So what happens? You come into the situation, same situation. How does the Rambam explain what happens? What word does he use? Exactly, perish. You separate. What does the Gemara use? Nitzal, you're safe from. What's the difference between perish and Nitzal? Active and passive. In the Rambam, you actively, you find the same situation, and you actively, because of tshuva, you don't do the same sin over. And it's not an interpretation, it's a girsa. The riff has the same girsa. But Rashi and others clearly have the girsa of Nitzal which is even if you're saved from it, which is amazing, even if it's passive. But let's go back to, this, to the original question. What are the odds of this situation happening to you again? What are the odds that you are going to fall into the same place, the same time, the same situation? You know what the odds are? The odds are almost 100%. Look at source number 18. So Mitchell, and another uh, passage, was really amazing, talks about life, a metaphor of life, as Penelope's loom. Penelope's loom. Okay, do we have any English literature majors here? Any English literature majors here? No, you weren't. <laughs> okay, Homer in the Odyssey depicts Penelope Odysseus' loyal wife is becoming sieged by suitors during his many-year absence. Okay, I'm going to assume that most have read the Odyssey, which is, so Odysseus was uh, fighting the Trojan War and then got lost in sea on his way back, the whole Odyssey. And at the same time, Penelope, his wife, 
they, they assumed that he was dead, or, or the suitors for her hand would assume that he was dead, and she didn't want to marry any of the suitors. She'd prefer, she wanted to wait or never marry anyone because of her love for Odysseus. So what she said to her suitors, the potential suitors were all in her house, eating her food and, and drinking all the, the wine. What she said is, I need to weave a shroud for Laertes, which is Odysseus' husband. And when I finish weaving that shroud, I will then be ready to marry a suitor. And what she would do is, she would weave the shroud during the day, so they would see that she's weaving, and then she'd unravel it by night. So it became an endless project. She would weave the shroud by day and unravel it by night. Look at the second paragraph. Like Penelope and the underlines, each of us weaves and unravels, constructing our relational world to maintain the same dramatic tensions, perpetuating with many different people as vehicles the same longings, suspense, revenge, surprises, and struggles. Like Penelope, in the seeming purposiveness of her daytime la labors, we experience our lives as directional and linear. We're trying to get somewhere, to do things, to define ourselves in some fashion. Yet like Penelope, in her nighttime sabotage, we unconsciously counterbalance our efforts, complicate our intended goals, seek out and construct the very restraints and obstacles we struggle against. Psychopathology and its infinite variations reflects our unconscious commitment to stasis, to embeddedness in and deep loyalty to the familiar. We constantly relive the cycles of our past. What are the odds that you'll be in the same situation and the same place, it's very likely. Even if it's not that same person, it could be different people. It'll be a different way. You'll find another way if you don't work on it and you don't change the pattern of behavior. You can very well stumble into the same thing again. You'll create it subconsciously. For the Rambam, it says about tshuva gemur. The Gemara just says, any bal tshuva. That's how you're a bal tshuva. When do you ever get to the situation? You get to the situation. And you have an opportunity to change a bad cycle, destructive cycle, by making other choices. And if you make other choices, that changes the destructive cycle. What's amazing in the Gemara is you don't even have to choose if you're saved from it. Like take Kate and Mitchell. Kate didn't know what she was doing when she was talking to Mitchell. Take your healing conversation, your mechila with somebody else. You don't even know the subconscious levels that you're affecting when you're creating shalom between you and somebody else. You don't even have to be conscious of it at times. If you're saved from it, you'll emerge a different person. Kavachomer, of course, you try, and you create the situations for it. That's the uh, uh, way that one becomes a Baal tshuva. We naturally repeat patterns. Freud spoke about two impulses through each person, eros and thanatos. That eros is a drive to live and to love. But at the very same time that you have this drive to live and love, there's also a thanatos, which he calls a death drive, which is characterized by repetitive, destructive behavior. Stasis. You repeat patterns of destructiveness, and you can't get out of it. You're stuck. If you're stuck in stasis, if you're living these cycles, you're not really living. You're not evolving. Life is growth, is flourishing, is, is developing. Death, thanatos, is repeating the same destructive things over and over again. 
Tshuva gives one the opportunity to evolve and to grow. And this, I would suggest, is perhaps a deeper meaning of Sifrei Chaim and Sifrei Mesa. On Rosh Hashanah, let's say you're a Benoni. It's 50-50. You're right in the middle. Anything you do, you know. And that's what we're supposed to think of ourselves in our tradition, that we're a Benoni. You have 10 days. 10 days to do good deeds, to do tshuva, to change patterns of past behavior. If you can't do tshuva then, if you're still in the old patterns, you are in the Sefer Mesim. Of course, it's a book of sentencing. Yes, Sefer Mesim, as Noah said, it's a book that sentences you in, a, in, in your fate. But it's also the psychological reality. You're in the book of Sefer Mesim because in your life you're Sefer HaMesim. You're acting as if you are dead. You're in stasis. You're repeating bad patterns. You're not growing. The whole point of Yom Kippur is to give you an opportunity to heal your past. And if you don't take that opportunity, you are indeed in Sefer Mesa. That's what Yom Kippur gives us. Yom Kippur, in so many ways, gives us the opportunity to heal our past. To heal our past, which include our past generations, to bring the past generations with us, to write a new story, not just for ourselves, but for them, to heal our relationships by giving and granting forgiveness, and to heal our own destructive patterns of behavior by emerging anew and growing. And I think, it's true for every Yom Kippur, of course. But I think about healing and healing our past, especially on this Yom Kippur. Perhaps the most common global experience of this past year was disruption. Due to lockdowns, social distancing, closures, and health protocols, the patterns of our lives were disrupted in ways like never before. What was the effect of this change? Were we happier, more fulfilled? nervous or anxious. Studies show that disrupt, despite all the disruption, our personalities have stayed the course. According to one study from Florida State University, most personality traits showed no change at all. Contrary to expectations, our underlying personality traits proved quite durable during the disruption. Reading this, I was reminded of a story by Hemingway of The Sun Also Rises. There's a character who was beset and troubled by these problems. And he said to his friend, I need to move. I'm going to move. And his friend said, who realized that the problem is that he was the cause of his problems. He said, you can't get away from yourself by moving from one place to another. Even when a world changes, the patterns of our own selves can prove to be quite stubborn. And now we can better understand why. No wonder our underlying personalities remained intact even through the pandemic. If you were irritable at work before COVID, the same unhealthy dynamic entered and exited the pandemic with you as well. When we run away from our ghosts instead of confronting them, they continue to haunt. How do we lay our ghosts to rest? So often we're stuck in the same recurring patterns the same mistakes in the same context with the same people. Escaping these repetitive patterns is not easy. I believe that the answer is the place, the primary place, that we focus on conscious action in the process of tshuva. We need to consciously make different choices than before, to chart a new path from our past. Tshuva is not just a sense of reflection and confession. It's about making new choices and creating a new set of actions. Vidoy makes conscious what was previously some conscious. But a full tshuva is not realized on Yom Kippur, but after Yom Kippur. It's about forging a new path for our actions that reimagines your past as a roadmap for a new sense of self. As we approach Yom Kippur, I'm thinking about our past and how it's functioning in our lives. Surely over the past two years, we still have many ghosts. While the world changed, much of our patterns of ourselves did not. And each of us needs to ask ourselves individually, what continues to haunt us? 
And through tshuva, we can constantly chart a new path and transform our ghosts into ancestors. The experiences of our past can nourish instead of negate. Each of us could approach the coming year with a renewed sense of mission, purpose, and confidence, allowing our past to enrich and laying our ghosts to rest. More broadly, I think about this in the context of our community. What role does Judaism play in our lives? Does Judaism feel like a ghost or an ancestor? When we think of our religious community and commitments, does it haunt or nourish? Does our relationship with our past upend our relationship with our present, with our family, with our friends, with God? And how do we write the script to redefine the lives of our past, to sanctify the lives and sacrifices of those who came before us? The Sifrei Chaim and Sifrei Mesim are open. The lives of the past are waiting to see our actions. Our repetitive destructive cycles are able to be healed. Our fate, our judgment, is in our hands to decide. What will be our response? And this is a question that is not just to us as individuals, but also as a community. And to this, I have great encouragement. It seems to me that over the past year, the Yeshiva University community evinced a great deal of spiritual confidence in our leaders, our values, and our responsibility to each other. We saw in our halacha, history, and, and heritage, the ancestors who nourish and sustain our present and our future. With all the uncertainties of this past year, we've expressed by our actions that even without a map into the future, we have a compass, that our values are our compass. It is what gives us strength, confidence, and a clear direction. They fill us with meaning and purpose. And this is important not just for us, but the polarization of the Jewish people and the broader society. Our community and our Torah values are essential for the future. By believing in ourselves, we can best impact those around us. We honor our future by charting a new past, transforming our ghosts into ancestors. I am so proud of our Yeshiva University community and so encouraged about our future as leaders of tomorrow. Fully committed to Hashem, embodying our Torah values, and bringing those values out into the world. My bracha to all of you is that as we emerge from our past, we should do so with a year and years of good health and happiness for nourishing, enriching, and enlivening a lifetime, a journey, a life journey, that each of us ready to create a new future together. Shana tova, umetukah.